Welcome back to the Fit Dad Club podcast. You're here with Travis Jones and Jason Barrett for another exciting episode. Well, hopefully it's exciting for you as it is for me. I'm back. I wasn't here last week. I'm back this week. Welcome, Jason. How are you? I'm doing well, mate. I'm doing well. Glad to have you back. It's good to, to have someone to bounce off. Otherwise, it just feels like me ranting into a microphone for, for 20, 30 minutes. It's just, it's just not as fun. No, it's not as fun, mate. It's not at all. Um, well, anything exciting happened over the last seven days for you, Jace, before we get into um, it? Oh, I mean, you know, life, life is exciting. You know, we've got all these opportunities, got more dads coming on board and changing lives. And, and we've got, uh, you know, some cool stuff coming up the pipeline for everyone on the podcast too. So, um, yeah, just, just exciting to, to, you know, I had a few guys from the group share some recommendations for, uh, topics and stuff like that. So just, uh, you know, just, just seeing everyone coming together and getting some good results is uh, always motivating. What about, what about you? Anything cool? Um, I learned that I'm not a doctor and I shouldn't cut my own stitches out. I think that's the main thing I learned over the last week. I, I had like five stitches in my calf because um, I had um, like a spot on my leg that they, they wanted to cut out and I had to go back to the doctors yesterday. But I, I tried to look at my constraints in my day. I was like, oh, I don't know if I can fit in the doctors. You know what? I'm going to cut these stitches out myself. So I cut the stitches out myself and I don't think the stitches actually work ready to come out, um, which the doctor probably would have told me if I went to the doctors. Um, and uh, then I cut the stitches out and I moved my leg and you know, my cut, my stitches and the whole cut split open. But she's got some butterfly band-aid stitches on there right now, so she'll be good and it will just take a little bit longer to heal. And I did go for a run yesterday and um, I'm okay, so that's all good. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, most think, people uh, well, learn that lesson yeah. a bit earlier in life in terms of you know the whole maybe doctors cut the stitches out i don't know nah, man, nah, nah, i don't learn lessons like that <laughs> to be fair wife, i've never had stitches yeah. so you know <laughs> who am i to say there you go. I, I, um i think that's the only thing i like i didn't do it with my sons around it's like in that, it's the only regard. It's like, don't do what I do, do what I say. That's the only part of the world. I must go to the doctor. Um, and my wife just yeah. shakes her head at me. But today, guys, we are going to go through something quite great for all of you there. Um, mm. And we're going to go in depth into it. So, so many people get results and then they lose the results. So many people start on a journey and never get the results. And I think it's because of these three crucial things. And these are the three things you must stop doing if you want to get long lasting body transformation results. It's like, mm. I don't care about your before and after. I care about your before and after, after. Like what happens like 12 weeks later, like two years later, like six years later. Uh, like I want you to transform not just your body, but I want you to transform the way you see health and fitness and the way you see life. Um, and to be honest, the way you see yourself. And I think these three things we're going to talk about today um, are going to be the cornerstone pillars to your long lasting results. Um, now, I, I think if, if you write some notes or just like, you know, pause, you know, listen to multiple, these multiple times if you can, um, because it is going to be crucial to you. Now, the one I hear the most when we're bringing on new guys and, or, you know, the, uh, I've coached over thousands of people in the last uh, two decades, um, is they need to stop setting vague goals. Um, and I think people are set vague goals because they're scared to set specific goals if they don't achieve them. And if I set vague goals, it's like, eh. uh, but that's the, actually the thing that's holding you back. We, we're like, I want to lose weight. And it's like, okay, cool. I'll chop your toenails off. All right. You lost weight, probably like a hundred grams, but like you lost weight. Good work. <laughs> Depends goal. how big your toenails um, are. Yeah, exactly. Go to the toilet. Um, and he lose <laughs> like 500 grams there. Um, yeah. but I, I think, you know, you said, I, I just want to lose weight. It's like, how much weight? And they're like, oh, I don't know, five kilos. And it's like, well, it, uh, like, why do you want, what's, where's five kilos come from? Like, mm. well, where's 10 kilos come from? Like you, you're unspecific about the number and you're unspecific about the bigger thing is like why you want to achieve this number. You're just pulling numbers out of the air. And then what happens is when times get tough, because it's just a number and there's no meaning to it, we give up and we retreat and it was another failed attempt to lose an arbitrary number off a scale, which is just gravity against your body to the earth. Like it means nothing. Um, and because your goals are so vague and they have no meaning behind them, you don't achieve them. And you know, if your goal was more specific and it had some weight, like some actual weight behind it of why you're actually trying to do this thing, like why you want to change your life, um, then 
you would do it. It's like, uh, I think a big thing is like, if you had to lose 10 kilos or I uh, would, you know, kidnap your child, uh, would you give up? <laughs> like, <laughs> you wouldn't, right? Like, um, depends. It's still school holidays right now. So some people might say, yeah, they, they, uh, they, they yeah, take, 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 take them for a week and then I'll lose 10 kilos. Weeks. But I think when we're looking at this, you have to understand if there was a, like people, I can't lose weight. I can't lose weight. It's like, no, nah, man, like it's just not a gun to your head scenario for you. You definitely can do it. You just didn't have a strong enough why. And no, I'm not going to go around kidnapping your children just to make sure you have uh, more weight to the goal and actually follow through with what you said you're going to do. But I think if you can try and create some reason, some why behind it, um, then you might actually stick to the plan. And like sticking to the plan is stop setting vague shit and make it specific and, and make it a, a big enough reason behind it. Mm, I think one of the things that I see a, a lot with the guys that I um that I bring on board is they they want to lose like a certain amount of weight. They might be like, oh yeah, like five or ten kilos or something like that. They'll they'll set a, a vague number, and as you said, they're just kind of like, oh yeah, roughly this much. I think for a lot of people, it's um they get caught up a little bit in the number. They're like, oh look, I don't know how many kilos I need to lose. Um, in order to get to like where I want to. And I don't know how many kilo, like they're, they're kind of confused them because you can lose and I've, I've, we've both bought a bit on this journey where it's like you lose a certain amount of weight and you're like, I really thought that that 20 kilos would look like more weight off me, but I just feel like I look like a smaller version of me and I've lost 20 fucking kilos, right? Um, it's always that sort of last five to five to six kilos that makes the biggest difference physically. Um, for a lot of guys, what I then get them to do is like, let's focus on what do you then want to physically look and feel like as well? Because that can equally be a specific goal, a specific why that you're working towards. Do you want to take your shirt? Do you want to see like the outline of your four pack or your six pack? Or, um, you know, do you want to see bicep veins? It's like you, you and for a lot of guys, it's like you've you've got to work with the... If you can't, don't know what the number is, right? Like you'll basically just be like, All right, I'm just going to work the plan until I lose the amount of weight I need to to get to this physical goal. I want to you know, see my four-pack, see my six-pack, um, you know, whatever the, the physical aspect of it is. You've got to have a clear idea of what you want to look like if you don't have a clear idea of the number. Because then that way, you've, you've as Trev's saying, you've just got to have like a benchmark that you're actually working towards because then you know what your progression is. Like no one wants to just lose weight infinitely until just maybe I feel good. It's like, no, I've got to have a thing that I'm working towards. Maybe it's, you know, a picture of yourself from your 20s or your or your, your late, late 20s, early 30s, whatever, where you're like, oh, I'm looking really fit and healthy and good here. Like, I want to get back to looking like that. Um, sure, you might have been, you know, 10 kilos heavier or five kilos lighter or whatever. Like, it doesn't really matter. What matters is that you are specific with either the weight that you want to be at or the the sort of end result that you want to have from a physical perspective, which is why visualization is so important. Not only from you know this perspective of knowing actually what you want the end goal to be, and then you know maybe sharing that with your coach. So you, if if you want to look like Alan Richardson from uh, from Reacher, uh, and you, 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 there's a lot of extra things you're going to have to do to get there. Like I know I'm never going to look quite like that uh, unless I get on some very radical therapies very quickly. <laughs> um, but uh, so it's but it's important to know like all right, well then what do you want to look like? Um, and you've got a you've got a measuring stick. You've got a goalpost that you can continue to check in. And go, oh, how am I progressing towards this? Um, that, that's a big one for me. I think is if you don't know the number aspect of what how much weight you necessarily need to lose, it might be fitting into size thirty two pants again. Like that might even be your goal. But it's like the biggest thing for everyone to understand is you can set a goal, and once you hit it, you can set another one. And then achieve the next one. Like it's not like this one goal you set has to be the be all and end all, and this is the final goal that I'm aiming towards. Like some guys, like oh, like oh, I hit it now. What? I'm like, well, are you happy? Like oh, not really. I want to keep going. Oh, well, then let's just fucking keep going. Like once once you're in that momentum. But the biggest killer is having a vague goal and having no real juice behind why you want to achieve it. Because when I tell this everyone, when times get tough. And you know, the kids are bugging you and you, and you had a long day and you've got, it's like, it's either you order Uber Eats and there's the pizza or there's whatever in the fridge and you've, you're like, oh, just I could just grab that and it'll be easy. It's like, the decision I want you to make is, all right, well, I'm either going to be a fucking role model and example for my kids and I'm going to be the healthy fit dad version or I'm going to order pizza, I'm going to spiral out of control and I'm going to, you know, die early of heart disease before I see my grandkids. It's like, that's the level of, like a perspective you need to have from a big picture. It's like, yeah, there'll be some people who can make that decision once and go, okay, cool. I did it. It wasn't great, but I'm not going to do it again. But when you're making those decisions consistently, it's because you haven't got a big why. It's like, fuck yeah, I don't want to die of heart disease early and I want to be a role model for my kids. So that should make it easy, but no one has that juice, you know? 
man, a hundred percent. I think you, you, the one thing I do want you to stop um, out there saying is, I'll be happy when I lose 10 kilos. It's like, no, you should mm. be happy now. Like your weight doesn't determine your happiness. Like becoming the best version of you as like, as long as I'm optimizing myself and moving towards the best version of you, which sometimes has setbacks, then I'm happy because I'm on a journey, right? Uh, you, 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 that's, that's the biggest thing. I, I, you can't say I'll be happy when, because when you achieve this milestone, then you think you're going to have this euphoria flood of hap happiness comes in and your life actually doesn't change, right? You know, your, your blood pressure might be down and your high resting heart rate might be down. Um, and yes, you might, might live a little bit longer, but at the same time, it doesn't go, oh, wow, I'm happy now. I was like, no, you wake up, you're the same person. You still have to eat food. You still have to breathe there and you still have to shit, right? Like you have to do these things, right? Mm. Your life doesn't become happier all of a sudden. You might have a bit more confidence, but I, I think what you want to look at is like, you go, I want to lose 10 kilos because I want to sit, fit back into my th size 32 jeans because that's when I felt my most confident version of you. Because you can be an unconfident version, version, still be happy. But I was like, that's when I was the most confident version of you. I mean, I, like I, I felt great when I had my shirt off and I was down the beach with the kids. Or I was down the beach. My wife looked at me in a certain way, and you know, you know, whatever it is, right? But you have this why behind you. But I think, you know, as we're projecting forward to the future version of ourselves, I, I think it's it's like tipping your hat to them. Is what I always think about. It's like. Why, why do you want to lose weight? Well, it's like, I want the future version of me. Like, I want to lose 10 kilos because I want the future version of me, the one person who's here one year from now to have an abundance of energy. I want them to, you know, be able to run five kilometers if, if their kids want to run five kilometers. I want to, after a long day of work, I don't want them to feel like they have a lack of energy because the kids want to play. I, they, I still want to have the energy to play with my kids. I want, if the kids want to go down the beach, I don't want to have that thought go through my head Oh, I don't want to go because I don't want to take my shirt off. Like there's, that's the thought that goes people through people's heads, right? I, mm. I want to be confident in photos. The person next summer when we're taking photos uh, down the beach, I don't want to. I want to be able to look back at those those photos and feel like impressed with what I've created within myself. Because you can't. I think the biggest thing is like you can't. You know, buy like the abs, like you have to work for them. Uh, mm. I, I think, you know, it's, it's the person you're becoming It's the abs is not the thing or the weight loss is not the thing is, is the, what is the journey or the person you had to become to get the thing, which is the real, real reason we do it. You know, we want to become a disciplined person. We want to become a person of, of character, of integrity, of self-respect, right? Because that carries across in other aspects of our life. And I think the more specific you can get, like 10 kilos, size 32, more confidence. I think if you can attach, um, for some of you, um, it's good to have a deadline on this or a time. I'm going to do this by October 1st and I'm going to run a 10K. I'm going to run my first 10K. And I think if we can attach these, like also not just weight loss based goals, but physical feats to it. We're also, when we times are getting tough, it's like, oh no, I still got to run that 10K. And it kind of kicks us into gear and it stops us being complacent on the journey. Uh, I think that's mm. another thing. So it's a, attaining this, this physical feat inside your goal. So it even creates more specific and more momentum. I think that's, a, that's that one extra, you know, added element to make sure we're going through with it. And I think the last thing is, like I have weight to this when I look at it, not physical weight, but weight as far as the weight I put on my um, staying with my health is my kids are going to go through hard times in their life, right? They're going to try and achieve things in their life and it's going to be tough and they're going to fall on their face. And I want to be able to relate to them and talk them through how I got through hard times or how I accomplished um uh, I, I, how I achieve these goals that I set out for myself. And I think you don't want to, you, you want to go through your real world examples and they can actually lean back as like, say you were 30 kilos overweight and you're like, you know what, I'm going to draw on the line of sand. I'm going to change my life. And over the next year, I'm going to lose 30 kilos. Um, I don't care how old your kids are. They'll take that in. It's like dad's discipline. Dad's changing. Dad's going for a run. Dad's going to train. Dad's um, not drunk all the time. Dad's whatever it is. Like they'll take this in. They'll see how you overcame. And I think I want to go through hard things and I want to 
like rise to the goals that I set myself. So then I can help my kids go through the hard things that they are definitely going to go through in their life. I don't want to just tell them to give up because you're always going to be overweight or you're never going to get the girl or you're, ne- you're always going to be broke with ah, life's hard and you know, the world's against you. Like it's like, no, like I want them to understand that they have the, the, the power in their hand to change the trajectory of their life at any point of their life, but it's going to be fucking hard to do it. And I'm there with them and I'm there to help them through it because I've also been through it as well. I think for me, like that's like, massive weight to like keep pushing forward that that's my own thing anyway yeah i mean it, it comes down to fundamentally being an example right and you can sit there as a dad and preach uh, and uh, there's a guy i listened um listened to a couple of podcasts with his name's uh, dr billy garvey he's a developmental pediatrician talks a lot about like raising kids and then the stuff that he sees in clinic with um like with like psychology sessions with with children who have been struggling and 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 all that kind of stuff and um you know they talk about oh you know i'm gonna have this sit on the end of the bed conversation with them at 15 and say don't do drugs and come to me if you're ever offer drugs okay good talk like yeah, I love you. That's it. And it's like, no, you be, you build and foster that relationship with your kids from the young age and from consistently being there and consistently showing up and consistently, you know, not not you know punishing them if they come to you and said that they did something wrong and then they feel safe to come to you later on. Like you can't undo all of that with one sit on the end of the bed conversation, as he calls it, which I really like that sort of visual of. Um, but beyond that, it's like, that's the same way that you set examples. You can't sit on the end of the bed and tell them, hey, do this and do this and do this when all they've seen and they've watched you do is the exact opposite. So it does come back to setting an example. It's like, oh yeah, I remember dad went through hard times and he kept going. So when he tells me to keep going, I put stock in that because he kept doing it, right? They've got to see you show up and they've got to see that example. Um, One final thing I wanted to do on this one was you mentioned the happiness, which I think is such a, it just triggers something that's such an important part because a lot of people will gatekeep happiness behind achievement or behind certain goals or behind, you know, sometimes they even, um, it's even, you know, food or alcohol that ends up being the quote unquote happiness for them. So I think one of the biggest challenges that, you know, we've got as, as like fitness and health educators in this space is the, the psychological side and the mental side where people are constantly gatekeeping and seeking happiness outside of themselves um, because they think that that'll be the answer. It's like, all right, well, I'm unhappy or I've had a hard day at work. If I have a beer or a pizza, that'll make me happy, right? Oh, the kids, oh, we're going to have pizza. Yay, oh, so happy we get to have pizza or whatever. Um, and, and that's the the thing. They probably just appreciate that they deal with a less stressed out person uh, as a dad or a mum who's not having to fucking cook and parent at the same time. And it's like, oh, yeah, dad's going to just sit on the couch and play with us for the next 30 minutes while the pizza gets here. Otherwise, it's free, you know? It's a, he wants it to come in 31 minutes. I don't know if they even do that offer anymore. Um, Uber Eats driver is just sitting in the fucking in the car park like a, week, a, a K down the road and you're like what's he doing sitting there with my pizza um, and then you get half a pizza that's the that's the that, that's a good way to lose weight just keep ordering from Uber Eats and let them steal half of your meal from you um, but exactly. exactly exactly but the thing for me is like that that happiness you can be happy and still want to change. Like you can still be a, you can be a work of art and a work in progress at the same time. Just because you're wanting to change something about yourself doesn't mean you're not allowed to be happy. doesn't mean that you're not allowed to be, you know, happy with who you are. Cause yeah, you're the person who, guess what? Recognized that they needed, that something needed to change and they didn't. Yeah. You could probably be unhappy with yourself if you're looking at yourself and saying, I'm not going to do anything about this. Yeah. That's probably going to lead down a route of unhappiness, but you don't need to be fit to be happy. You don't need to have abs to be happy. I would say that you need to be progressing in some form to be happy. And for a lot of people, like progress equals happiness. So if you're not progressing, if you're not moving towards, um, you know, the best version of yourself, yeah, you're naturally not going to be happy. But if you are moving towards that best version, make sure you appreciate it. And you sort of mark that and you say, yeah, I am progressing. I am moving towards the best version of me. Um, you know, whether, and then rather than saying, oh, I'm only allowed to be happy once I get abs, cause it's going to be a fucking miserable journey. And you're going to get there and realize, well, look, I'm not that happy. Like the biggest thing I had when I, you know, got abs for the first time was my pull-ups were a lot easier. Uh, that was like, that was what I noticed uh, that, and I was fucking cold cause it was winter and I had no, no, no insulation. I was freezing <laughs> and I had no energy. Um, the first time it was, it was a bit too lean, but like happiness doesn't need to be gated behind goals. But it is, it is kind of gated behind progressing and moving forward and taking action. 
So if you take action, you're welcome to go ahead, feel as happy as you fucking want to because it'll keep you going on the journey. Um, but stop also looking for happiness behind external things, right? Stop looking for happiness behind the bottle, behind pizza, food, whatever, because it's just not helping you. Uh, I, mate, just to, to conclude on that, um, Martin Seligman, who's written a bunch of books, and I think he's like really cornerstone the positive psychology movement. Um, and they've ta- stopped talking as much about happiness and they start talking about well-being um, mm. instead of happiness. Like people want like well-being because, you know, things can happen, but we can still have well-being. And they, they have an acronym which is called PERMA. And they, they go, if people have these five things in their life, they're going to have well-being, which is good. We want to feel good. So, you know, they want positive emotions. They want to be able to um, understand and have some form of EQ, which they can understand the emotions they're feeling and actually feel those emotions, understand when they drop down to a lower frequency and how to get back into a higher frequency version of yourself and choose better quality emotions and how you're interacting with the world. Um, Also, uh, engagement. You need engagement um, with society, okay? You can't just be an island, right? We need, for well-being, we need engagement. Um, we need to have relationships, right? We need to have relationships with our kids. We need to have relationships with our, our friends and family. They also need to have meaning, right? So, or like purpose. So, meaning is in PERMA. So, we need to have meaning. And also, the last one is accomplishments, so like you need to, and like what you're saying is progression, progression is accomplishments. They're the mm. same thing. So like, like if you're creating these milestones and you're getting that progression or you're accomplishing those milestones and like that means we're constantly in a state of well-being. You know, we're not trying to pursue happiness. We're constantly, and we can constantly have a state of well-being because we're following under these this acronym of PERMA. And it's like, well, if I want to feel better, I need to have well-being. Well, do I have positive emotion? Do I have engagement? Do I have relationships? Do I have meaning? And I'm achieving. I'm not achieving. Why? Oh, because I set shit fucking goals, right? So, let's, let's, so stop being vague. Stop being vague yeah. with your goals um, and create ways where you can accomplish on the way to your journey and accomplishing accomplishments could be like what we're going to get into in a second it could be just doing like a 10 minute workout a day you doing that is an accomplishment which gives you well-being Uh, i think when we're looking at the second part is like creating unrealistic plans and this Mm. is the the biggest thing that holds people back it's like stop creating unrealistic or unsustainable plans uh, and you try and do everything and like so many guys and so many people do this it's like oh, i'm gonna like it's the start of the year still in january you probably get this episode you know it's still in jan um and you're like uh, you've probably started keto low carb um you, you've joined like f45 and or you're running trying to run a marathon or you're trying to do these all these things and like in december you're 30 kilos overweight you, you drank every day and you had pizza hut three nights a week um but like you can't go night and day like Mm. don't try and do everything yes some people like some people have to hit rock bottom and there's like a bright line so it's a very bright line it's like you had a heart attack okay (laughs) or or something happened and all of a sudden yep that's a night and day moment where people can flip the switch and be a completely different person Mm. that's like one in a hundred right most people are not at one in a hundred can sustain a complete change because you didn't have a life threatening issue. Like mm. normally it's life threatening. Like mm. uh, that, that is like, or someone close to you dies or, or they, something really dramatic happens. And that can be a big enough, like punch in the face for you to do something about yourself. But for most of us, yeah, yeah before it goes, you know, from night to day, you have to actually go through like, the, the sunrise, right? It has to be gray for a period of time. Um, mm. you, you have to slowly change the habits from this to that. And so many people make these unrealistic expectations upon themselves, which you can't live up to. I'm going to go keto. Or I'm never going to drink again. Like you're, you're telling yourself these things. It's just, it's not going to happen, right? It, it's not going to happen. But instead, if you go, well, I'm going to eat protein with every single meal or I'm going to start with walking. How many steps are you doing? I'm doing 5,000. I'm going to do 7,000 steps a day. And don't ever say 7,000 steps a day. I'm going to do 49,000 steps a week, right? So if you miss a day and you hit 5,000, well, tomorrow you can try and catch back up and you can still get 49,000 in the week. So you need to look at it and you need to create sustainability. And a few people have said to me, Jay, sorry for continuing to go about this. A few people have said to me about, I'm doing this, uh, 
90 day fit dad project at the moment. They're like, dude, just, you know, you're getting five points a day. And my, my points on a daily basis is I, I want to dedicate 24 minutes to my health. Uh, and that's, that's, that's my lower limit, right? That's my lower limit is 24 minutes. I hit above my lower limit nearly every day. Right. But yes, I only hit 30 minutes. Like I ran for a 6K run and it was like just under 30 minutes, but I went above my lower limit. Um, I want to spend 30 minutes a day actively with my kids. I, I want to meditate on a daily basis. Like I want to hit my nutrition, my calories on a daily basis. Um, and the fifth one is something. I don't know. I'm doing it every day. Um, but if we look at it and I'm meditating, right? Um, but if I look at it, I sort of broke it down at the start of the end. They're like, oh, it's, it's unsustainable. You can't do this. Like you can't train every day and you can't always spend time with your kids and you can't always, you know, spend time with your mental health. It's like, dude, like all I looked at is like, I'm going to spend a minimum of 2% of my day on my health. Can I do that? Can I spend 2%? out of the 100% of my day dedicated to health? Yes, I can, because I, I know I can. I've got, I've got 2% there, because 1% of your day is 14 minutes. 2% of your day is 28 minutes, right? So yes, I can send, spend 2% of my day. Can I, the, the kids that I created on this planet, right? Can I give them 2% of my day? The children who I gave life to, like, well, they came through live, but I also was, you, I was you there, helped. I was part of the process. <laughs> exactly, mate, they didn't happen without me. Right? Like, can I give those people who are breathing and relying on us 2% of my day because kids spell love, T I M E, can I give them my time and make them feel like nothing else matters except them for 2% of the day? Yes, I can. My mental health, can I dedicate 1% of my day to my mental health? <laughs> like, I believe it's important, and meditation for me is my mental health. I believe I can dedicate 1% of my day to my mental health, which is 10 minutes for me meditation, but that's 14 minutes. Um, and then I like, so like 10% of my day is allocated. Um, when I look at it, it's like I dedicate 1% of my day to planning my day every single day. That's 14 minutes. I also dedicate 2% of my day to my personal development. I read for a minimum of 28 minutes a day. And I dedicate 2% of my day like of undivided attention to my partner. So 10% of my day, like before anything else, that these are the things that actually matter more to me than money, mm. than anything, right? So I'm like, okay, I've got 100% of my day. I'm going to carve out 10% of my day out of the things that actually matter. My mental health, my kids' relationship, my actual relationship, my personal development, uh, my own health. Like, if I carve that out, okay, cool. I still have like 21 plus hours in the day to sleep and to work, right? And to commute for some people out there um, and get that in. Like, I looked at it and I was like, yes, this is important to me. So, if you actually start to look at the breakdown for that um, and understand the percentages, I, I believe everyone else could have five point days as well. Like mm. I, I just do. Um, it's just about time management and prioritization about the things that are healthy for you because they're like, oh, I don't have time for that. It's like it's 2% of your day. Like you can do it. And I think this is sustainable for me yeah. in my life because I understand how much time I have and can allocate the percentages correctly. Um, I, I think that's a big thing. Mm. One, it, it's, it's understanding how much time you have, understanding the percentages and then prioritization and project management in, as far as your life goes. Yeah. I think too many people, they think they have less time than they do, right? Um, they, yeah. There's Because there's a lot of time that you're, you're pissing away. Like there's, there's a lot of fat in your average day that could be dedicated if you just stopped, number one, stop trying to multitask and do six different fucking things at once. Oh, I'm trying to reply to this email, but I'm also trying to fucking spend time with my kids and I'm also trying to sort of talk to my wife at the same It's like, if you get like real present time, you don't need much more than that. Like if you're really fucking present with a workout, you don't need that much more than half an hour, right? Like unless you've got some specific goals. If you're doing that every day, if you're doing a good half hour, that should, for, for most of the guys out there, that'll be fucking enough, right? 24 minutes. You do a 24 minute email, you'd be fucking dead by the end of it, right? Like Dude, if you, you do the right one, like shit, like Trav's going to film ones later on and it's going <laughs> to, it's going to be bad. Um, he's going to try and send some for, for me to do. Luckily, I don't have that many heavy dumbbells at home. So I have to, I, I was like, oh, I've got, I've got to use the five kilos, Trav. It's just, that's all I've got at home. Um, but you don't need that much more than that. And I think people get caught up in 
uh, quantity over quality. If you're spending quality time really getting present with your emotions, really getting present with your mindset, if you're spending quality time in your training and in what you're doing, this comes back to not following a bad plan that expects you to spend an hour and a half, you know, doing shit every single day where you've got to do all this different stuff. It's like, look, if you include a bit of protein and veg in most of your meals, like one of my, um, like one of my, my sort of minimum rules, and this is what Travis was talking about, is like my minimum is I hit that 24 minutes of, of activity. And I, I love that. I really, really love that. And I want to start incorporating that myself. Um, yesterday, funnily enough, my, sh- my car is in the, uh, the service. I had to run to the IGA. I went for a run to the IGA to grab an onion because I needed one onion for dinner. We didn't have one. So I ran to the IGA and back. It's probably only like... 10 minutes total, like five, probably five to ten, five to eight minute run there, five to eight minute run back. Um, but I was like, oh, I'm fit enough now that I can run. And I come back and I'm not puffed out. I was like, I'm enjoying this running thing. Um, but setting that minimum standard for how much you choose to move, um, you got to set those minimum standards across the board, but not making the minimum standard be, I've got to train fucking six times a week, right? Mm. And tra- yeah, Trav can implement these things. You know why Trav can implement these things? Because he's been consistently doing probably most of them for more than the last 90 days. Like yeah. I would say, He's probably get at least a minimum of four points a day for fucking years, right? Yeah. So for him to then step it up and do the five and just make sure that you know you don't miss a five point day consistently, it's not that big of a stretch for him. For someone else, it might be. So rather than going from zero, as Travis is saying, from zero to a hundred, from nothing to a completely unsustainable plan where you're cutting out entire food groups and you're, you know, trying to train as much as you can, as hard as possible all the time, it's like Let's step it up. Let's go, as Travis saying, 5K to 7K steps a day. It doesn't have to be a huge fucking bump, but that's enough that will keep things going. People underestimate how much um, intentional and quality time spent on something can really get, like, that. what you can get done in that time. And also, the impact of if you put your phone down, you put all distractions away, and you sit down with your wife, you light a candle, right? Yeah, you, you, you make dinner first, you light a candle, you serve it, you just sit there and you look at it and you say, how are you going? Like, I really wanted like, there you go, the panty melter, right? Um, hopefully the kids aren't in the car, but that will, that will, that will, you know, get you many, many, many brownie points because you're just purely present and you're there and you're, you're spending quality time, but too much of our time nowadays, like I've seen guys, there's a little place near us called Banjup Local, which is like a, um, it's basically like a little farm. It's pretty much Trav's house, if you think about it. Um, but there's a farm and they've got like cows and chickens and goats and shit like that everywhere. Um, and you can, for the price of a coffee, you can go in and there's like a big sand pit and all this play stuff for kids to play. It's, it's an awesome business model. It's just a farm that they've just carved out a bit of and said, hey, come here, buy a coffee and the kids can play. And the amount of guys I see just sitting there on their phones, just scrolling while their kids are playing, I'm like, it's just, it, it, it kind of breaks my heart. Cause I'm like, there's kids that are like, dad, 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 look at me, dad, watch this, dad, dad, dad. And then they're just like on their phone, fucking scrolling. I'm like, man, they're just the, the more value you would get out of being present with everything that you do means that you don't have to dedicate as much time to it because you're really fucking taking, you're taking it by the horns and you're actually doing it. Same thing with productivity and work, right? Rather than trying to alt tab between fucking three different projects at once, Getting one thing, then cool. I'm going to focus on this until it's done. Then I move to the next thing. Right? Is doing those using those pomodoros as sort of sixty to ninety minute blocks of focus. Um, the same thing with your health. Same thing with your tracking. Rather than be like, oh, I'm going to try and track this, but I'm also going to try and do. This. It's like no, ten minutes start of the day. I'm going to spend this time. I'm going to track the food that I know I'm going to have. Boom, boom, boom. It becomes a lot easier when you're in flow. But when you leave it and leave it and leave it, and you're like, oh, what did I have? Did I have a Snickers bar? I can't really remember. There's a wrapper in my car. I don't know where it came from. I just blacked out, you know? Um, but this, all of this kind of boils back down to not having a an unrealistic plan or an unrealistic expectation of what you are going to be doing from the get-go and setting your your stepping stones, as we talked about before, your progress and your progression and your achievements of, all right, you know, one of my guys, he's like, cool, I'm, I'm going to start by getting back into my walks and I've got a couple of yoga sessions I've been enjoying, so I've been doing those. And then next week, I'm going to start doing my weight training sessions. I was like, awesome. This week, he started doing his weight training sessions, right? It's the progression. Rather than take a look at your week and go, oh, I'm just going to try and cram more shit in there. Take a step back and say, well, what is realistic for me to implement right now, right? It's just part of smart goals, you know, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic. It's got to fit within your actual schedule, But I also think there's a lot of fat in your schedule that you could probably cut for shit that's more important to you. Don't say something is more important to you 
if you're not making time for it in your current schedule because there is a lot of stuff that you're doing that is you know is not more important but you still fucking do under the banner of oh it's helping me unwind it's helping me relax but it doesn't actually help you do that scrolling your fucking phone doesn't help you do that like we know that it's an escape at best so just be real with yourself be honest with yourself and and yeah just just understand your own tendencies and that's just kind of what this podcast is about is helping you kind of dig that a little bit deeper Mate, hundred percent. I think that the bad thing about setting unrealistic expectations or placing unrealistic expectation upon yourself that you actually don't have the ongoing sustainability or ongoing um, ability to adhere to is all it does is you're like, oh, I've got to train for an hour, six times a week and I've, you rock up and then you miss a day and you're like, shit, it's a loss. And then you miss another day. Oh, shit, it's a loss. Um, or I'm going to eat keto and then you don't two days in a row. And then you, what you do is you start just racking up L's mm. constantly. And then you remind yourself that you're a loser, right? <laughs> because losers lose. And then you start having negative talk where you're like, I told you you couldn't do this. You can never lose weight. I can't lose weight. I'm always going to be fat. We start using language that is um, so like concrete and... Um, what's the word, uh, magnified. There's an actual word that people use with us. But we, we're using la- language which is like cemented in, in like for the rest of our life. Mm. But instead, if we have these, th- the best plan not adhered to um, will never beat a not best plan consistently done, right? Like my plan is the, isn't the best plan, but it's consistently done day in and day out, which means I beat someone who can't do the best plan in the world because they just don't have the time. Like I'm a dad, I've got a business, I've got a partner, all the rest of it. So my, my, my plan is most optimal for me, not the most optimal plan for someone who is an athlete who's going to the Olympics, hmm. right? Like I, I think we have to understand our constraints. And that's why my lower threshold is 24 minutes because I can always hit that. And I think that's so crucial for us to understand. And because for me then, instead of always racking up L's, I'm racking up W's on the daily. And do you know what happens if when you keep racking up W's, you start to feel like a fucking winner, right? And winners, like, they get shit done. And when you feel like a winner, what you're doing is you're cementing and you're cementing just not the W's, but you're cementing an identity of someone who gets shit done. Mm. And if you keep racking up L's, you're cementing an identity of someone who can never get shit done. Right, like so, you actually need to start to create a lower threshold. It's like, dude, I want you to work out 15 minutes. I want you to do five rounds of five, 10 push-ups, 10 sit-ups, and 10 squats. And I've started some of my guys at things like that. And they're like, man, that's so little. I was like, well, it's more than what you were doing, right? Don't, we're talking about creating a lifetime transformation, not just a five-minute transformation or a five-week transformation. Because if I can create you as the identity of someone who consistently wins, as we increase the level of complexity and intensity, then you already have the self-belief and self-confidence and self-identity um, of someone who is a winner. And winners get shit done. And winners strive to do that little bit more. You know what losers, losers do? They don't strive to do the extra, right? They just don't. They want to do the bare fucking minimum. But if you start to create this identity of a winner, you're like, I'm going to do a little bit further. I'm going to run a bit further like Jace is. I'm going to go a bit further. I'm going to go a bit harder. I can do a bit more. And we start to, rather than questioning, like, oh, I can't be bothered. You're like, you know, you're like, I, I can do that. Like your, your internal dialogue shifts from, I can't do that to like, maybe I can. Maybe I can actually achieve that. And we start to get this like, you know, we, we, we start to question ourselves in a positive way rather than a negative way. And it actually gets quite fun and exciting as our internal dialogue shifts. And I think that's what I, I above anything, I want to create self-identities in dads where they just feel like they're unstoppable fucking machines that like, and not machines. It's like, you can run ultra marathons. Like, no, but unstoppable machines. Like you, when challenges arise, you can rise to the challenge. Like mm. that's what I want to create with the dads. It's like, cause when it's, when it's tough, like, and you've all, you've done hard things consistently and you've continued to progress the level of complexity of the hard thing. When a hard thing comes out of left field, it's just another hard thing. But if you've racked up like six months of losses and then a hard thing comes out of left of field and you feel like a loser, you'll, you'll treat that obstacle like a loser and you'll allow it to beat you. If you've racked up six months of Ws, you'll treat that obstacle like a winner does and you just fucking run straight through it. 
right? Mm. He might slow you down a little bit, but you run through. And I think that's the biggest thing with creating like having a low barrier to entry to winning, slowly increasing that barrier to entry that builds a self-identity that we want to create inside yourself that gives you the victories as well. You know, you, you want to rack up as many W's as you can on as many days, consecutive days as you can. If you miss a day, then you just keep going and you try and beat the streak you had of the W's previous to that. And that's what we need to be doing with that. And I think it changes that self-perception. I think that's the biggest thing. Mm. If you can start small and win, you look at yourself as a completely different fucking person. And over time, again, it's not like it's, what's the James Clear quote around the trajectory versus like, it's, it's not what uh, your current trajectory is. Yeah, not be more concerned current, with your current trajectory um, than your current, current results. Trajectory. Exactly. Like, I, I think that's the biggest thing. And the W's are your current trajectory. So your results are going to happen. Like focus on the process and not the outcome. Like if we just keep wrecking up like wins on the process on the daily, you're going to get the abs. You're going to get the body. You're going to run the marathon. You're going to be the, the 2% with your kids. You're going to have the great relationships, right? I think it's like the most amount of time with your kids, right? Like, you know, 90% of your kids' lives spent with them is before they're 17. And the, the other 10% is from them being 18 until you're dead, basically, right? So like you, you want to have such a good relationship with your kids that that isn't 10%, right? After they turn 18, they, they don't move countries away from you, right? Like you want to try and be with them and then want them to actually be with you as well. I, I think it's so crucial. And that's why I break down my percentages so I can try my best create relationships with them. I think that, that is so crucial with sustainable plans versus unsustainable plans, which set you up for failure. Mm, Have you got anything uh, else to say around that, Chase? No, but I think that does kind of tie in nicely to the the final point, which is around you know you got to stop being your own hater, uh, and that's that's where you your sort of whole point around racking up the wins and kind of congratulating yourself and giving yourself a pat on the back and having that self reinforcement comes into it because you can have a great plan that you stick to uh, for a period of time and you can have a really clear goal and all that kind of stuff, but if you are constantly constantly in your own head saying, you're not fucking good enough. Why are you even doing this? You're probably just going to lose the results again anyway. And you're constantly, oh, that person's doing great. Oh, fucking, you know, um, I don't look like Alan Richson. Fucking no one does, bro. Come on. Um, if you're constantly doing those things <laughs> and ev every time you have one little hiccup, you're like, oh, you see, I knew it. You, I know you knew you couldn't do this. Like if that's your fucking mental self-talk and that's how you're sort of talking to yourself, even if you're consistent following the best plan, even if with all of the things lining up, you're getting the result. If that's your mental self-talk, you're not going to keep it for long. You're not going to keep it for long. We talked about this, um, I think, two weeks ago. There's two kinds of motivation, right? There's there's away from motivation and toward motivation. You can be motivated by away from wanting to be fat and wanting to be unhealthy and wanting to, you know, I want, I want to be away from that sort of stuff. I don't want to feel like that anymore. Um, and it's a strong motivator, but it could only get you going for so long before it burns you the fuck out. And that's what this mental hating on yourself will do. It will burn you out. It will um, grind you to dust because you, you can only take so much of it. These little nagging thoughts, you know, this is why people end up in really severe mental health um, like spaces because they have these constant nagging like pinpricks, like death by a thousand cuts of just like, you're not good enough. You can't do this. Da, 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 da. So you've got to be willing to do some some mental work around that and, and start by first of all identifying like wow like taking a step and this is a, a useful tool I find for dealing with negative mental self-talk is taking a step outside of yourself almost you can do this with your like your eyes closed obviously you know, don't do it right now if you're driving but like if you just close your eyes and you almost like step outside of yourself and you start you like picture yourself looking at yourself and you're like Man, he's, he's thinking some real fucking negative shit right now. Like, he's he's you know, oh, that's like a that's that's brutal. That's I'd say that's probably untrue. That's probably unfair. But because we get so caught up in the emotion of it, you know, it's it. We kind of want to beat up on ourselves sometimes, and we want to go, oh, woe is me, and and play the sort of the victim card. Because then it justifies usually a lack of results or it justifies um, quitting or giving up when things get hard. But in reality, we've got to step back and say, no, hang on, like what's actually going on here? And this is where, and this is where that, that preventative time of actually scheduling a time to meditate, scheduling time to be with yourself and be with your emotions comes into things. 
because it's, it is like preventative medicine for that negative self-talk because it allows you to kind of work through your emotions and how you're feeling today. But number one, if you do set some more realistic goals and you set a lower barrier and you so therefore you don't beat up on yourself and you do celebrate the fact that, yeah, I ticked the boxes today. I won. It doesn't matter if I did 24 minutes or I did two and a half fucking hours. Both people tick the box. Like it doesn't, it doesn't matter. You both, you tick the box. It doesn't matter what it is. So you've got to, and I tell this to guys who, yeah, who first come on board, we could schedule a workout that is, yeah, uh, 10, 10 rounds of 10 push push-ups, 10 squats, 10 sit-ups. That could be the workout. Trav or I could do that workout. Probably Trav, maybe not me. I'll probably get exhausted. Um, Trav could do that workout. And then by the end of it, Maybe not, you know, oh yeah, my, my chest is probably a bit pumped. I'm probably a little bit sore, but it's not nothing crazy. Um, someone else could get, let's say, six rounds into that workout and be fucking dead and done. The person who got six rounds in got a better workout, ticked the box better than Trav would have because that would be too easy of a workout for Trav, potentially, right? Like, you know, depending on the scale. Like obviously, you can push yourself hard enough to get it done. But if you were just to, you know, go in there and just do that and you didn't get the stimulus or you're like, oh, I picked up these two kilo dumbbells. Oh yeah, I did my 10 curls. You didn't fucking tick the box. Someone who picked up the 10 kilos and only managed to get six when they were aiming for eight, they still tick the box. It's all about relative effort, right? So this is what I tell all my guys who come forward. I don't care where you start. As long as you're pushing yourself and you're getting like as far in, that is better than someone who's really fit doing the entire workout and then not really feeling like they broke a sweat. Because then it's like, you might as well just been fucking sitting there. What's the point if it was that easy for you? So that's the mentality that you need to take in is every little win, every little tick, you've got to celebrate. And you've got to say, yeah, I like as Trevor's saying, just like me. I did this. I'm proud of this. I did this. I achieved this. I've ticked the box today. You know, pat on the back. Good job. Good job. Um, but that's that's kind of one of the biggest things when it comes to negative self-talk and sort of being your own hater. You've got to kind of uncondition it. A lot of us learned it from our parents and learned it from generational stuff. But um, you've got to take a step outside of yourself about why am I being so hard on myself? There's, there's going to be enough people that hate you in your life. like that you <laughs> For no fucking yourself. reason. Right, it just is. Um, so I was like, yeah, you've got enough haters out there already. Like, you don't need to add another one, which is yourself, to the equation. And I think the biggest thing with the hater, the hater raid, you know, saying it was like self hater raid, comes from as like a comparison trap. Like, we look at someone mm. else's chapter twenty and we compare it to our chapter one. Like, I'm on like chapter seventeen of my journey. Right, like there's people who are. If I compared myself to other people running or other people lifting or other people's physiques, I'd be like feeling bad about myself. But I'm like, no, dude, like, like I'm good for me. Like I'm still getting faster. I hit PBs last year for me. I didn't hit someone else's PB. I hit my PB. It's a personal best, right? Like I think that's what we have to remember. It's like so I will compare my journey to no one else's. And no one else should, comp- like, so someone says, like, dude, you got to rack up a loss so people feel better about themselves. Like, no, man, like, I'm running my chapter. They can run theirs, right? Like, I'll, I'll hit my streak, and if I miss a day and I don't get five points, then I didn't get five points. And I'll learn from that. But, like, we have to run our own chapter. And, like, this might be chapter two for someone right now on their fitness journey. They could be a chapter three, whatever it is. But it's like, don't fall into comparison trap. The only person you should compare yourself to was you yesterday, you last week, and you like the week before, right? And that doesn't even mean you might have a step backwards, but you want to continually try and strive for progress, like we talked about, well-being, accomplishment, in your own journey on a weekly or monthly basis. You're progressing on your journey and the book you're writing, which is your life. And I think that is a big thing. If we can get away from that, we stop a bit of, you know, haterism towards ourself. Um, and it will just stop that, like a little bit of negative self-talk because like, oh, why? They're, because what happens is we say they can do that because they're lucky. They can do that because they have more time. They can do that because they don't do X, Y, and Z. They can do that because I'm a single parent. They can, like, we can find all the excuses and all the justifications and all the blaming in the world for why you can't do what someone else can do, right? But at the end of the day, while you're sitting there complaining about why you can't do it and why they can do it, can, can do it you're not doing the things you can do. Hmm. So just focus on what you can do and not what everyone else can do. And then you'll probably be better off for it. And we'll start to build that self-esteem because we've stopped fucking caring about everyone else. Like, you know, there, there is only so much things you can care about in life to, to quote Mark Manson. Like there's only so many fucks you can give. So give a fuck about the right stuff. Right. Hmm. So you have to start caring about the things that actually matter. Someone else's Instagram journey and someone else's physique and what someone else can do. It's, it doesn't change your life. And because it doesn't change your life, you shouldn't give it any more thought 
than scrolling through it. I think that's the biggest thing. Um, and then you have to say, yeah, you actually have to pat yourself on the back. Like Jay says, like, yes, you do it. You do your 24 minutes or you do your 12 minutes or you do your six minutes. You go, yes, just like me. Like, like that is just like me to do the 12 minutes because I am someone who does what they said they're going to do. And as you start to build that self-respect, your self-talk changes because you're someone who starts to go, yep, that's just like me. I show up. I show up every day. And then also when you take a, when you, when you make a mistake, right, you go over your food or you miss a day of training because of whatever reason you, you go, you know, you have to go, okay, well, I had a limit. I didn't hit the limit. It was a mistake today. And uh, like, which is just a, you know, we separate, separate the words. It was a mistake. Okay. So if I was to take that, um, you know, opportunity or day again, how would I do it differently to make sure I didn't make that mistake? Right. So we have to reflect and we have to play it out in our mind. For visualization is so cool, so key to this. And you'll know the bit more of the neuroscience behind it. But something as far as our, like our subconscious brain and uh, can't tell the difference between sometimes visualization, the actual thing happening. And that's mm. why we visualize ourselves going through the error again. Is that correct, Jace? Yeah. Like you're, when you think about something hard enough and you think about something vividly enough, um, and this is why you remember old things and you get pissed off and you relive conversations and they make you mad and like you, you get a fucking physical, like you relive the argument you had and you get the adrenaline again of, oh, this is what I'd say this time. Um, <laughs> like you, you go through those things again and again <laughs> and your body physically responds to that because you remember it. And it's the same thing with, you know, and this is in, in you know, NLP and, and psychology is known as anchoring. You think about previous past positive experiences and they make you feel good again, right? So the more you can visualize something positive happening uh, and you winning the day and getting things right and going well, and you anchor that in again and again and again, and you keep visualizing that, the more likely it is you're going to do those better things because you've got like a set path of what you know you're going to do. Because we talked about this before with, you know, it's like structural discipline versus reactive discipline. You've almost like set in place a plan. Next time this mistake comes up or this this opportunity to make a mistake comes up, I know what I'm going to do differently. Um, and your body, yeah, your body especially can't tell the difference. So if you're imagining going through something, you know, and, and that makes you anxious, you're going to feel anxious, right? It's not fucking real. You're not, you, you then like, to be fair, anxiety itself isn't real. It's all fret about something in the future. Anxiety lives in the future. If you're anxious about something, you're thinking about all of the different potential possible outcomes and how some of them might be negative. It, like that's not actually real. That has not happened yet. It's like, don't bother being anxious about something and, and worry about something that hasn't happened yet. Right. And the same thing in the past, like the past is the past. There's nothing you can do, go back and change it. But when we relive this stuff, it, it relives it for us almost physically as well. And you get the same emotions, you get the same cortisol rush of stress and adrenaline and, and sadness and anxiety and whatever. So just be really, really present with what are you choosing to relive and focus on? And that's where the, the, by taking control of your mind and going, I'm going to anchor this towards the positive and I'm going to think, hey, what can I do better next time? By asking yourself better quality questions, you're going to get better answers. Ask yourself better questions about how can I make this day better, not why did I fuck this day up? Because then your brain will go, well, here's why you fucked it up. Here's why you fucked it up. And then you're going to feel worse. So cha <laughs> changing the angle of the questions that you're asking yourself is a big one for getting more positive psychology and more positive self-talk. How can I do better next time? What more do I need to do? Uh, what pivot did I need to make? What do I need to see in advance? What do I need to do to make this better? All of those questions are going to be far fucking better for you than why am I such a failure? Because then your brain will go, oh, I know. And then you feel like shit. Your brain will find anything, whatever you ask it, it will find the evidence to make you feel correct. Like if you say, mm. oh, I'm such a loser, then your brain will constantly walk around showing you where you are a loser and like they'll be highlighted, right? If you constantly feel like you're winning and you're a winner, then you constantly, your brain will constantly reinforce everything you're winning. But that takes time and practice to actually start racking up the wins. And I think that takes reflection and projection as well. And not enough people reflect on their day if they did rack up a loss in an area of their life and sit down. It's like, okay, well, I lost. I had a loss today with... Uh, my kids and I didn't spend the 2% of my day with them. You know, if I, if I run through my day again, where did I deviate from my plan that I had laid out and why did I deviate? It's like, okay, well, instead of doing this, like I, I went here and I had a coffee because I was a bit stressed and it's like, okay, well, did that solve it? Yes or no? And it's like, if I was going to replay the day again and rack up a win, how would that lay out? And you literally just visualize yourself 
like visualize yourself like driving if I, this happens again i will drive through this then i would come back and I, this is me playing with the kids this is how my play my play this is how i would play with the kids and then you would go yep that's just like me that's me doing it and then you, you have cemented a visualization of how you would handle the situation next time better and differently and you've reinforced that with visualization so next time it happens you're more likely to rack up a w instead of an l i think that's so crucial like reflection and projection i think that is so key to your your self dialogue and self talk i think another th another thing is you know if you go oh i don't have negative self talk like in your notes section over the next 7 days guys every time you talk shit to yourself i want you to put like a line just put a one Right, open up. Like I talk shit just then. Okay, put a one. Talk shit just then. Put a one. Every time you say something negative towards yourself, like put a one in there. And in a week's time, you'll actually be quite surprised mm. how how many ones you might have there. Um, and then it's like, okay, well, wow, that that was a realization. But you know, you have to have awareness precedes change. Uh, I think we need that at times. So we need to be aware that no, I do talk some shit to myself. And instead of talking to yourself, I like to think about it. It's like if your friend fucked up right? It's your friends trying to achieve this journey and they're trying to lose 10 kilos because they want to be a better role model for their kids and not a warning sign. And like, you know, they're trying to lose weight and they're, they're trying to do these things and they rocked up a loss. And like, you know, if you're talking to your friend, it's like, would you say, oh, dude, you're such a loser. You can never follow a diet. You're going to be fat for the rest of your life and you're going to be not a role model to your kids. And no wonder you don't have a great relationship with them. It's like, you, you, mate, your friend would probably punch you straight in the face um, for one, but you wouldn't say this to them. Normally with our friends, it's like, you know, if Jace racked up a loss and I knew he was going for a goal, it's like, dude, like, that's okay. Everybody's human. Like, even like Olympic athletes <laughs> rack up losses. Mm. So you're just human. But what we need to look at is we're on a journey and why did we rack up the loss today? And like, you let me know, like, why do you think you're right, racked up the loss? And do you think, one, do you need help from me? Or do you need more accountability? Or do you need more planning to make sure you don't have that same loss happen to you again? That's what I would say to, say to Jace, hmm. right? I would, I would essentially have a, as Jace called it earlier, I would have a sit on the bed, end of the bed conversation with Jace. Um, and I would talk to him about, it's like, dude, like what happened? Why did it happen? How can we not make it happen again? So you can actually get these winning and get these, this accomplishment that you want. Now, if I started talking to myself, like I talked to Jace just then, I would be better off. Mm. I'd be like, I'd, I'd have a sit on the end of the bed conversation with myself, right? It's like, mm. dude, you racked up a loss today. Like, that's okay. You're not going to win every single day. No one ever wins every single day. But why did you rack up the loss today? Do you need more accountability? Okay, yeah, I need more accountability. Okay, who can be more accountable? And you start having this internal dialogue. Well, uh, Jace could help me be more accountable. Okay, I'm going to message, okay, make an action plan. I'm going to message Jace right now before you get up. I'm going to message Jace right now. It's like, dude, I'm racking up a couple of losses with my nutrition at the moment. Can you keep me accountable for the next seven to 14 days so I can get the W's back on track and I can start getting momentum with my wins again? Mm. And you send that message out. So all of a sudden you create an action plan whilst in that moment. So then you've created this plan so it doesn't happen again. You overcame the obstacle with a plan so you can get the outcome you desire. And I think that's so crucial for um, ourselves to move forward. Talk to yourself like you would your best friend rather than you would your worst enemy. Mm -hmm. Because at the moment you're talking to yourself, a lot of people like you're talking to your worst enemy and like you're rooting for them to fail. Mm, yeah, I think if we, yeah, like the things you say out loud, if you said the things you're saying to yourself out loud to someone else, they would uh, they would block you immediately. Um, yeah, you've you've. I think you've got to have more compassion for yourself. Like we don't expect everyone else to get everything right all the time, but we kind of expect it of ourselves. And I know when self talk can be the most uh, critical is often when we know we haven't given it all and we haven't given enough. Um, like we haven't done enough. Like we we know we left a little bit on the table there, and it's like look that's like, that's okay. It's okay to leave a little bit. If you can, it's like, you know what they say, um, P's get degrees when it comes to uh, like university, right? It's like, it doesn't matter if you get a high distinction, you know, unless you're going for, you know, fucking honors and, and trying to be the top of the class or whatever. But if you get, if you pass, you still get the degree. Everyone ends up with the same piece of paper, right? Um, and there are, there are times when then that mentality is okay. And there are times when you're going to be stretched and you're going to basically just get a passing mark. Um, you know, as long as you're not, 
you know, having those those failure days or those days where you're sort of learning more than you're more than you're winning, um, which is the the reframe. If you have a lot of those days, yeah, it's important to sort of sit down normally and have compassion yourself. Look, I know things have been hard, but I know you have a little bit more in you and I know you can push this a little bit more. And this is where that self-belief comes in because the more you can turn it around from those negative experiences, the better you'll get. And it starts with the little stuff. You, a lot of people kind of discount the little stuff, but it starts It starts small. It starts with that little conversation or that little thing. It's like, oh, I sat down instead of going for that you know, extra walk. Oh, you know what? I'm just. It's rainy outside or it's thunderstorms or you live in Brisbane and it's like 41 degrees and thunderstorms. Um, I'm just going to walk up and down my house. I'm just going to do some walks. I'm just going to go up and down my house for 10 minutes. I'm just going to pace and, and just get a little bit of extra fat burning in. I did something. I turned it around once. Awesome. Pat on the back. It might seem small, but you've got to start small because you've got to start the momentum building. It's like a dung beetle. It's a weird analogy, but it's like a dung beetle. Um, uh, it's a dung beetle that uh, is rolling You know, the big pile of poo. It's got to start with something small. It doesn't start with a massive one. You've got to start small and roll it up, roll it up, roll it up. And then what you're left with is a big pile of, uh, of gold, not shit, gold. Um, um, but you you do have to start oh, small, shit, yeah, big pile <laughs> of shitty gold, and you've got to pat yourself on the back, and you've got to be willing to give yourself that little bit of compassion. Like there's a difference between giving yourself, and this is kind of a generational and also a man thing, I think. Um, there's a difference between giving yourself compassion and you know, quote unquote, being soft on yourself and giving yourself a free pass to to be lazy and not do stuff. Um, so you've you've got to determine what that line is for you. When do I need a bit of compassion? Like, yeah, things have been a bit hard lately. And when do you need to go? Hold on, look, I know I'm capable of more. And that's the language you want to use rather than, oh, I'm a piece of shit. It's like, no, I know I'm capable of more. I know I can do more. We've all felt more supported from people in our lives when they've said stuff like that rather than, no, come on, you're, you're like, you're a piece of shit. You can do way better than that. Come on, what the fuck are you doing? As opposed to, hey, I know you're capable of more. I know you can push harder than this. I know you can go faster than this. I know you can do more than this. I know you're better than just sitting on the, um, on the couch. Like always frame it towards that positive. If you have to have that sort of talk with yourself, frame it at least towards the positive and say, look, I know you've got more in you. Like we both know you've got more in you. We both know that you're not performing at your um, at your peak right now. So let's just take a step towards that. 100%, mate. I completely agree. I think, you know, for everyone, if you can do just these three, or you can stop doing these three things that we talked about today, which is stop setting vague goals, if you can stop creating unsustainable plans and stop, you know, delivering the hater aid to yourself, I think if you can do stop doing those three things, you, you're going to have long lasting results with your transformation. You're going to hold the body of your dreams for the rest of your life. And I think, you know, most people do need help with this because just like I don't know how to fix my own toilet, I get a plumber to fix my toilet. Um, you know, most people can't change their body because you haven't got the skill sets and the discipline and accountability right now to do that. So sometimes it's it, you have to be humble enough to ask for help and advice and be coached along the way. And that's exactly why we have the Fit, uh, we have the fit Dads Club. Uh, if you go to fit-dad.club, um, you can jump on a call with us. We can see where you are and where you want to be. And we can see exactly how to close the gap to becoming the best version of you for you and your family. So go to fit-dad.club. We can have a chat. We can see if we're our program is right for you. We love changing dad's lives. You can refer this podcast um, to your friends, to your partner, to your dad, to your your whatever your kids depends on how old they are um you know remember 18 plus because of swearing um just sh share the love because we do this for you if you have questions um for us to do podcasts on like let us know as well rate review that's how we help more dads like don't be selfish like we want to help more dads and we want to give you the time to help you so share this with someone so we can actually help more dads because you sharing this could be the lifeline that someone needs to actually change their life for the rest of their life. Mm. So share it on guys. Um, and that's, that's it for me today until next week, guys, you know, much love from, from me and, you know, Jace, you got anything else you want to say? No, I think that's, that's it. Just, you know, my, I think my final message is, yeah, just be, be your own number one cheerleader. And if you're, if you're not there yet, let us be that person for you. Dude, a hundred percent. Like I'll, I'll transfer belief to you until you have it in yourself. And I think that's the biggest thing that we can do. Hmm. Um, have a great week guys until next week, you know, keep training 24 minutes a day, 2% of your day. Get it. <laughs>